cloud. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So this one might be a little shorter than some of the other ones, partly because I uh, started working on some stuff and realized there had been a change in .NET somewhere that was causing some uh, problems with the um, the uh, the watch folders wasn't working exactly like I wanted them to. I, I got them mostly working, so I will talk about how they work and whatnot. Um, but that meant I didn't get enough. I didn't get a lot of time to put a lot of examples together. So we'll go through a couple things that I want to talk about, and then if there's folks who have questions, we can answer whatever, um, and then um, and then go from there. Um, so that's kind of what my plan is. So. The, the goal of today is going to be to talk about um, three topics. Um, uh, we'll not deal with any of them with any particular depth other than maybe the watch holders, um, but we're going to look at uh, ways to automate mark edit um, through different um, processes. So one of them is uh, what I call folder watching, which is uh, a tool that was created specifically to um, simplify some automation work. Um, so that you didn't have to write scripts in order to do things. So the folder watcher essentially creates a, an event on your system, which will run on a periodic basis and will then do things. So I'll explain what that, how that works. Um, the tool um, also has uh, scripting components. So, um, you know, when I started working on MarkEdit 20 -ish years ago, uh, MarkEdit didn't have an interface. Um, it didn't have in your face until somebody had asked um, me to share it with a larger group of the community. Um, and so uh, the tool is really just libraries for me to write code to. Um, and that stayed because I do um, a bit of consulting work with folks in terms of doing uh, data migrations, especially very large ones. Uh, I prefer to script a lot of that work. So there's scripting interface um, that you can work with. And then there's um, a command line interface that runs um, in Mark Edit, which I use um, uh, fairly extensively on uh, Linux systems when I'm doing large work. And so um, we'll look at uh, where you can learn more about each of those. Um, um, and uh, I'll answer questions if anybody has them. Um, uh, like I said, I, I didn't have time to, to do a lot of examples where we will talk about how you can get information about them and then if there's follow up, we can talk about that at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about because this is really probably the one that is easiest for folks to work with um, because it's uh, self-contained and the program uh, runs it itself is what I call watch folders. Uh, the idea behind watch folders um, actually started out um, with some conversations that I was having uh, with some folks um, at my organization. We were wondering um, if it would be possible, because uh, there was um, some work that had been done um, creating some tasks uh, at the time. Uh, there had been some conversation about would it be possible for um, Mark Edit to essentially just run um, and run these tasks on things uh, the same way we do in some cases in our digitization processes. So I'm not sure how every institution does it, but I know in, in the past in a number of places that I've been at, um, we'll use things like um, uh, Abby Fine Reader, which has a way to schedule um, services against folders so that uh, as you digitize content and put them into a location, it will automatically OCR content and output data into a format that then you can work with later. And so that was really kind of the, the inspiration around this idea. Um, could you, if, if you take it to kind of think about kind of how market it's evolved where there's you know, the, the application and then task, which is really kind of this notion of, you know, taking those written out best practices and putting them into a form where you can just automate them and run them in one click. Could you continue that automation approach where you could essentially say, you know, anything I put into this folder, um, just process it according to these particular criteria. And so that was really the idea. What, how far could we push that kind of a concept 
so that, um, so that the application could do some of that. So I'm going to show you kind of uh, where this lives and we'll talk about this as we go. The slides have stuff in them, so, um, but I, I, I want to actually just look at how it works in Marketing. So at this point, the watch folders um, is configured inside of the preferences. And they're configured inside of the preferences because the way that the tool works, <laughs> it, it considers watchers um, almost like a Windows service. So um, this is only available, I should say, in, in Windows. I haven't quite figured out how to turn this on on the Apple side. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how that would work. But essentially, once you configure the service, um, MarkEdit will place the application into um, a startup folder. So every time your system reboots, MarkEdit reboots um, as a headless application, um, puts, a piece, puts a piece of software, a, a, an icon down in your system tray, and then just watches um, whatever you've told it to do in the profiles. And I'll it, that's what it does. So I'm going to show you here what, it, what you would expect to see if it was running. So I have it set as continuous monitoring because that's what I've worked on to get it running. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell it okay. Um, when I save the settings, if I've enabled the watcher service, the tool will automatically turn the watcher service on. If I shut the service down, it won't turn back on until I've restarted my computer or if you go to help and um, turn the watcher on by default. Um, so I can close that. So you'll see down here in the corner, there's a little icon that I have show up in my, um, in my sister tray, and this is MarkEdit service. The service here is a version of MarkEdit that runs um, as a service. It's a headless version of the application um, that has no interface other than um, if you right click on it, you can get back to the settings or you can view a log file if there's one present. Um, and all that it does is it sits in the background now and it's um, waiting essentially to do what I just told it to do. So I told it to continuous mo continuously monitor a folder based on a profile and we'll look at the profiles here in a minute. And if um, when that 15 minutes is done, um, it will initiate the application and the application then will check the folder, see if there's any content in it that meets a set of criteria that's defined within the profile. And then it will do whatever I've told it to do and output the data into a, an output folder that I've, that I've designated. So, and again, in the profile. So that's what's happening right now. Right now, while my, while my computer is sitting here, it's just, basically asleep now, that service is asleep now for about 15 minutes and it's gonna turn on, it's gonna go looking for, for folders to see if they're run. Um, so I've run it already so you can, so we can see what the, uh, the results look like. Um, and I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this um, and we'll look at the results. All right, so what does a profile look like um, with this service? So the profiles are configured here. So I have a profile here And a profile essentially um, has a couple of things. So the first one is it's a, uh, a folder, the folder where you're, you're getting the content. Um, so in this case, it can be, the folder can either be a um, FTP, SFTP location, um, or it can be a location that's on your hard drive um, or mapped through a, uh, through a, um, uh, a, uh, uh, map drive. We have information about file. If you use an FT, actually, let me create a new one here just for a second. So if you created an FTP uh, watcher, um, trying to, I have to actually make the whole thing. Uh, the tool will actually allow, will have you set up um, uh, username and passwords for your FTP. Uh, go back here and edit this for your FTP watcher. So if you enter an FTP path into your, your system here, the tool will um, look up uh, the folder that you point to, all that good stuff. Um, it'll use any passwords you give it um, as passwords. Um, I'm gonna stick with just folders because I don't wanna have, uh, I have an FTP one, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna use that because it hits it on a continuous basis. So this is my folder. So this is where um, 
it's going to <clears throat> here. Uh, so I put a folder in place here. Um, originally, I had all of these things in there. I'm going to explain what's happened in that folder. So here's the folder where it's going to be looking. Um, I can set up file names. So is it going to look at all the file names that are there? Or generally, what I end up doing is I end up doing something like this, where I say, you know, I want to just look at uh, .mrc files. So it will only process .mrc files. I give it a place where it should save the output. So where is it going to save the data at the end? Um, and then I attach processes to it. So what processes can I use so I can join all the files together, either first and last? Um, I can run um, conversions on them, so XML to mark. Um, I can run a task. So those are the, the things that right now are set up um, to be done. And so if I wanted to say run a task in this space, I would select the task. It'll give me a list of all the tasks that are currently um, installed on my um, machine. Uh, I would select the task that I want to run um, and tell it OK and add that task to the list. Um, if I want to get rid of it, I just select it and delete it. So right now I have two tasks. I have a watcher task that I created, which basically adds a bunch of fields um, just to make sure that I can see that it was running. And then a join task, which at the very end will join all of the files that have been processed together into a single file at the end. So that way I have one file to process at the, time, at the end. So when I'm done with that, I, I basically finish what I'm doing, I save the task, it creates this file. Um, if you want to see where those live, they're um, all saved in the configuration space. Uh, there's, once you start creating watchers, um, there's a watchers.txt file that gets created. This points to the location of the watch file. Um, the watch files are treated kind of like <clears throat> macros and tasks, so they live inside of this space. Um, you'll just see that they have a watch file extension. So that's where they're living. Um, so if you use Marquette, it's automatic backup. It's automatically backing those files up. So that way they're, they're retained. Um, and so I set up my watching. And then I tell it to turn on and the program starts. So what happens when a um, watch file processes? So uh, what ends up happening is when the the file actually does run, um, you'll see two things. So one is if you're on a Windows um, 10 device, it will print notifications. So inside of this place here, um, it will print notifications into this space that say that the watching tool has initiated, that it's completed, if there are any errors, what the errors are um, when it runs and actually does something on the system. If you're on a pre-Windows 10 system, then it'll show up as a little cloud um, uh, notification underneath the icon. So it'll show the, uh, that the watcher has started, if there's been any errors, blah, blah, blah. Inside the folder, so originally this folder had um, these three files in it. Um, when the watch folder runs, when the watch folder is initiated, the very first thing that it does is it copies all of the files that it can that it's going to process and it puts it into this dash originals folder and that has that serves two purposes um, the first purpose that it serves um, is that it allows the tool to compare files that get put back into this folder so that way if you were to put duplicate files in if they are exact duplicates then it won't run um, again against the originals it realizes that they're duplicates it sets them aside um, and it doesn't re-output them into the output. Um, if they're new, then it processes them and puts those new files into the originals folder. The reason for that processing type is so that if you're doing FTP um, processing, particularly from vendors, a lot of vendors leave the files there for long periods of time. That way it's not redoing the files over and over and over again. It, it has a way to understand whether or not the files have changed or not. Um, before it processes them. So it processes the data um, that's moved into this original space. These things are moved in here, it processes those files. Um, and when it's finished, it puts the output into this output folder. So if you remember my watch folder process, 
um, I asked it to process all the files that were there and then join them um, at the end. And so um, because um, the watch folder is automated, it doesn't ask for a file name. So it creates or joins this file that's joined results. And then it's a um, uh, essentially a unique number that gets generated at the end. Um, so that way I know that these are the, the results of my, 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 my set. So at this point, anything in this output folder, because this is where I told it to put finished data is done. And as a, um, a user um, of the program, if I went to this folder and I seen data there, I could copy that out and take it and um, put it into whatever my next step is, whether that's um, some kind of QC or whether that's um, evaluating it for uh, evaluating it for quality control or for loading it um, or passing it on to whatever system I'm working with. So the process allows you to create kind of these this self-contained process um, to um, automate a handful of, uh, of things. So um, you can add as many tasks as you want, um, but uh, there is the conversion component for going from Mark XML to Mark because I, I, I have a number of resources where we're getting Mark XML data and it, it makes sense to do that conversion. The joining is nice because then you can join up <coughs> data and not have to process multiple files at the end. Um, so there's some things that, that are that are happening. Here. So the way the tool is designed is um, the assumption that you probably have multiple workflows for different resources. Um, and so that's why the watch folder um, allows you to create multiple profiles, which means you could have different folders for different um, vendors or um, inside of a profile, you could have um, processing where if a vendor's file name, a vendor name was part of the file name, you could actually have a single watcher process the same folder, but only process file names with certain data in them. So um, you can create as many watchers as you want on as many folders as you want, pointing to as many output places as you want, um, and the tool will process as it goes. <clears throat> so what have I learned um, as I started playing around with this this week? Um, I learned that uh, somewhere between uh, March and now, uh, I think something's changed um, in the .NET framework, which is what MarkEdit obviously uses. Um, it feels like um, something has been updated that's causing um, the uh, scheduled processes not to work the way that um, I think they should. And so uh, when I was testing this over the, the, um, this week, I was finding that, that, that it was kind of hit and miss in terms of whether the schedule process would run. So I've been spending some time working on trying to figure out what's changed. I think I figured it out. So I will probably be updating Mark Edit this weekend. Um, the continuous monitoring does look like it's working. Um, I may actually add some additional options on the continuous monitoring side to set it up so that it continuously monitors either 15 minutes, one hour every day, um, and then have um, the scheduled processing time if you wanted to set a specific process time because uh, continuous monitoring uh, starts the process from when the application starts up. So um, every day could mean a different time. That's, that's actually why I like the scheduled processing because I could set it for, um, you know, right before the, uh, usually like at 1130 at night when I know that uh, nothing's running um, and have that flexibility. When the tool runs, um, you have uh, log files that get generated. Those log files live um, inside the app data and in the logs area. There is an actual watcher's log and what you would expect to see um, inside that log is basically an output of everything that happens um, during the process. So here um, is a statement uh, that starts saying, okay, we're loading the watchers. This is the date and time that it started. Um, this is really useful um, for me uh, if you are asking to try and debug why something's not working. Um, here it'll give you the, uh, the, the watcher. Um, it'll tell you the file that it's gonna work on, um, that it's starting a particular process, um, that it's finished, and what the results are. So true and false are gonna be whether or not the process finished correctly or not. 
Uh, next thing it does is it looks to create an output file. Or is the original folder the, fo the folder that you need to create there? Yes or no, creates folder. So you can go through and see all the tasks and things that it's trying to do. And then when it's finished, it'll tell you, um, you know, it did it, did it finish what the process was. So that way it's a, an easy way to debug whether or not things are running. And if you ask um, the tool to um, uh, show you the uh, log, this is the data log that it's gonna show you. This log is appended to, so um, the tool will eventually trim it when it gets to be a certain size um, so that you don't get logs that are ginormous, um, but it will keep track <coughs> of all of the logging that happens um, and it doesn't delete um, it more truncates them. That way you have a running record of all of the things that are occurring um, inside the background, on the background of the, the application. And likewise, um, if an error occurs, not only will it show up in this log, um, but uh, as part of the um, work that I've been doing on, on strengthening um, application, errors, it'll show up inside of these application error logs. So here we get information when there are errors showing up. So um, in this case, what we're seeing is this was the problem that I was having with the, uh, the tool, actually. It was trying to access um, a configuration file uh, that was being locked elsewhere. So that was one of the issues that I was having um, when I was playing around with this. So um, anyways, this is again, these things will, will show up inside of the, uh, the application to kind of help with um, debugging if you're trying to use the watchers and if you're trying to set them up. And again, like I said, there's some things right now that, that don't appear to be working, but they should by the time um, I get the program updated uh, this, uh, this weekend. <clears throat> and here's, uh, you can see an example of, of an FTP here. So FTP, SFTP, this is using um, uh, Eastview. Um, so you can uh, add those into the space. Uh, uh, FTP uh, works the same as a normal FTP uh, request. You, if you have to have a username and password, just embed it into the, the FTP URL. Uh, all right, so let's talk about, um, um, we'll move on to the next thing, and then if you guys have questions, we can come back to them. Um, so uh, script maker or doing scripts within Mark Edit. So um, I'm gonna talk about uh, what this is and how this works. Um, just so that uh, folks who are interested in scripting against the application have some information about how that works. So MarkEdit has a script wizard. Script wizard is a tool basically that generates a template. Um, it does some very simple things, but the reality is it was never designed um, to replace people doing coding. It was made specifically to help you with templates for um, doing basically everything that you need to do um, setting up all the helpers inside the scripts. So all you have to do is add your own logic. Um, I'll show you where all of these things live. So this is an example here of, of template functions that live inside the script maker that get generated. And I'll show you the, the an actual file and the template. So there's a script template. This is in VB script that does specifically for breaking files. It shows you the breaking function for making files, how you would make a function. Um, there are uh, routines that show you how to do conditionals for not uh, for working with variable fields for correcting data uh, that gets exported in triple i because that was something they used to have to do a lot um, but really the, the the gist around the script maker is to generate a template script for you that leaves you needing to just edit the data in this space so this is what's considered the main loop of the script it's where all of this stuff in the file um, gets seen so this is where um, if you were making edits to a script generated by the script wizard, you would make changes to this template. Um, <clears throat> the idea behind the script wizard was essentially to help speed up um, requests that I was getting from users when they would say that they needed to do something, they wanted to automate a, lar a process that was happening um, over and over again. Um, and could I help them uh, generate a script? So, 
putting a script together um, usually entails writing a bunch of the same code over and over and over again. So the idea was to create something that would allow me to generate just a template very quickly um, and then add maybe the 10 to 15 lines of code that actually needed to be written for a particular process um, inside of this main loop. Um, and so hopefully this, is, this will help in, for other people as well. So let me show you kind of where this stuff lives. <clears throat> so the script wizard itself uh, gets found um, under tools and uh, pretty sure I put it into yeah, utilities and script wizard. Uh, this generates uh, this uh, interface. Um, you can see that the tool has very simple things uh, in terms of conditionals. You can set if a field has a regular expression um, as a conditional, then add or delete a particular field. Um, if you want to modify field, if something has either as a regular expression or conditional, then um, do these things, um, adding a subfield if present or not present. Uh, very basic in terms of what it does, and then in terms of additional options, triple I specific stuff, so correcting 001s, fixing punctuations, blah, blah, blah. So the script wizard does these things. So uh, generally, I haven't used it to do these things. What I generally like to do is I just like to save the file um, so that I have a template that I can then work with. Um, but let's say you wanted to add a field, you could add a field, you know, 999, so field A, add this field. Um, and click the add field button, it creates a parameter. And then when I save the, uh, the script, it generates a script. And I'm going to do another one here really quickly. All right, so it generates a script. So what is that actually doing? So if we go over to my folder where everything should be, uh, we see two scripts that are generated. One is the VB script that I generated first. Um, and if we go ahead and look at that, if we look at that, you'll see that what ends up getting generated is very quickly um, uh, uh, template script that basically shows you um, all the things that's setting up for you to be able to use this. So at, once the script is generated, you can basically take a file and just drag it onto the script and it'll process. And so we can see here all of this stuff that gets generated for you. It's all template, 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 template. The part that we care about is the main function. Um, and the part that we care about really is this loop. This is the loop that, uh, that you edit. Um, if you want to change it. And you can see here, um, that's what's happened here is that the tool is generated um, in that loop a section that basically adds this field to the mark string before it writes it out. So um, I have this loop that I can work with um, uh, and make edits to so that I can automate uh, my work. If um, VB script isn't my thing. Uh, the tool also generates Perl scripts, um, and I've been working on doing um, uh, Python as well. Um, so this is, again, it's a Perl script that does the same thing. Again, templates uh, to do things. Again, we have the uh, main function, and we go into the main function, and here is our main loop. Um, again, we see here, this is the place where it adds the field um, into that main loop. Uh, so we can then go through um, and we can edit these. So uh, you can pick um, the, the particular language that you're interested in. I'm trying, like I said, I'm, I'm working on Python because that's uh, uh, one that um, uh, it, I would like to, to be able to work with um, on occasion. Um, challenge I run into is sometimes um, it's difficult in the script wizard to uh, determine um, the nesting of uh, how the uh, data should be nested. And since Python is, um, uh, doesn't use uh, brackets to determine when things start and stop, but the nesting of the spacing, using the spacing to determine, it, it makes it a little bit more challenging. So I've been working through that. So anyway, so this is what gets generated. If you want to add your own templates 
um, because you want to have templated code um, added to it, you can do that. Um, Mark Edit uh, basically has templates. They're inside the configs folder. Um, you'll find them here. Here's the visuals basic template. This basically has all of the data and you can see little places here where the tool includes things for where uh, the application will replace things to save data. So if you go to the um, uh, main function, you'll actually see how the application um, makes its changes. So here there's a place for when you're adding and delete fields, um, the generated code gets put into that place. When you're modifying fields, the generated code gets put into this part of the loop. But this gives you the opportunity to make changes to the templates itself. So if you wanted to modify the way that things sorted or you wanted to add your own helper functions, you can add them to the templates. And then when the tool generates scripts, you can make use of them. Um, again, same thing with the uh, Perl templates. They're inside of the, uh, the script here, Perl templates. And same thing, you'll see the same kind of process where you have saved arguments um, and again inside of the uh, the main function place where the add and the modified fields get generated so the templating allows you some flexibility to be able to make your own changes um, to the tool and let's say you wanted to do that so um, to do that you obviously need to know um, what's available for editing so there are I'm gonna skip this stuff. So there are documentation. Um, there is documentation on how the uh, the com objects work. Uh, so this is on the uh, the mark edit um, in the mark edit uh, page. Uh, there is a class file that talks about how the mark engine works, which is the engine that you can script to uh, through the uh, the on Windows. Um, the scripting interface has um, classes. Uh, that shows you what are the properties to each class um, as well as um, any methods so that way you can see um, what are the, uh, the uh, methods that you can use to actually perform operations so you can see there are things like add fields, stream functions, uh, changing encodings, cleaning temp files, lots and lots and lots of functions that are here that are exposed um, to uh, the user for working on scripts that are um, not necessarily embedded in the script wizard, but available. Um, so like here you can, this one is actually a function that will give you a, something back if you want to tell whether or not a string contains a Unicode character. Um, so lots of things that actually get used inside of the, uh, the application itself. Um, as part of the process and so they've been exposed for um, users who also want to script things. So the script engine includes uh, classes specifically for working with um, the mark engine um, as well as classes for working with what I call the query engine and the query engine is z39.50sru. So again, um, batch z39.50 searching, um, z39.50 search. Um, that uh, process will um, fold over for SRU as well. So um, if you have a desire uh, to try and write um, scripts against MarkEdit, uh, you can take the script wizard um, to start to understand how the application interacts with the uh, COM object um, on Windows in either Perl or VB script. Um, and then you can, um, use the help documentation here uh, to enhance those scripts so that they do other things, um, which ends up being really useful. So uh, if you had a very large file, so for example, um, occasionally I'll help folks uh, do database transformations. Um, and while Mark Edit doesn't have a limit to the size of the files it can work with it, you know, if you try and run uh, 30 million records through MarkEdit, it can take a while to do the interface. Um, it makes a lot of sense in those cases to, to write a script um, and just have the process go through and, and deal with everything at once and just output the data. <clears throat> so in those cases, the being able to, to script against the application actually becomes really um, handy. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to talk about is mark edit 
and its command line tool. So Mark Edit has um, a command line um, program um, on Linux and on Windows. It's called C Mark Edit. Um, it's a command line version. This is because I'm in Windows, um, a, a graphical version of an application can't run as a terminal. Um, on a Mac system, it works differently. The same application that runs Mark Edit runs the terminal. So um, you would call it slightly differently. But this allows you to essentially expose most of the tooling that's available in the graphical version of Mark Edit through the command line. Um, I'm going to show you, those are some examples. I'm going to show you how you actually get to the command line so that you can see it in case you want to play around with it and see kind of how it works. So um, there are two steps that you want to follow uh, when you're working with the command line tool. The first one, to make your life easy, um, is in the uh, preferences. You would go to other and you would check the option here that would set an environmental path. Um, and what that does is it sets it up so that you don't have to remember what's the command line uh, path, what's the path to Mark Edit. Um, and this is really useful for me because I'm running Mark Edit on my development instance. So the path is actually buried deep into a set of folders. So what that does is when I set that path and I tell it okay, it builds into um, the application uh, it builds into your operating system environmental path, and this works also on um, the Mac version. So now when I go to my command line tool um, here, I can, if I wanted to see my mark edit path, I can go directly to it <coughs> because that environmental variable stands in for um, the path, that full path. Where that's really useful um, is uh, let's say I'm in my desktop. Okay, so let's say I'm here and I want to process a file. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see here. Let's go to my webinars. Uh, webinar eight. There's a webinar eight. And let's say I went into my. Let's say I wanted to process the data in this file. So in Windows um, and anywhere, because Windows uh, works slightly differently than Linux, but same thing. You have environmental paths which point to where it knows where applications live. Since Mark Edit lives within its own sandbox space, I would have to be able to tell it where in the world um, the application is. So I can shortcut that process by basically saying percent Mark Edit path um, slash C Mark Edit dot exe, and now I'm passing the the I'm I'm I now ask for the application if I type in help. I can see the help file. So I've actually run the command line version of Mark Edit. I've outputted um, the help part of the program. Let's say I wanted to run Mark Edit and I wanted to break something. Um, I, but I don't remember how it works. I could do something like this and tell it type. Uh, let's see here. Type. I think that's right. Let's see. Look at my example here. Okay, yeah. Uh, whoops. Example is, what is it? It's a, uh, oh, make break. There we go. Got it. All right. So if I wanted to break a file, um, I could enter the tool, source from the source file, D for where it's going to save the file. <coughs> and then um, break. So that tells it we're going to do the break and then run it. And so the tool then would run through the process. If I just wanted to run the tool and have it ask me some questions, it'll ask me for a source file, a destination file, and then a type of operation, make or break, and then it'll do things. So I can do um, command line stuff. 
I included here uh, inside the, the slides a way for you to see some of the, the ways you could do some, uh, some things. So in this case, you could do source file, destination file, and task file. You can automate validation. You can automate cleaning to remove invalid records. You can automate uh, mark edit telling you whether or not deep dupes exist. Um, as well as you can export um, delimited text data by using a function that looks like this. Uh, mark edit has um, uh, help files that show you how to use the command line tool. So in this case, I'll take you out to this place. So this is um, a file, a knowledge base article that shows you um, how to, um, some common ways to use the command line options with linked data, as well as doing the bib frame transformation, as well as other additional options. There's also another place here that shows um, a little more information about how the command line tool will work on your system, as well as the Mac OS equivalents. Um, so you can see how it would work on the Mac system. Um, again, those are included, whoops, uh, inside the PowerPoint tool, uh, the, the command line, the, um, the PowerPoint here, which I'll post on to um, slide share like normal. But the idea here is that uh, in Mark Edit, while I think most people probably use the tool within the GUI application, um, there are a large number of people that automate it through different processes. Um, the, the, by and large, I think most people um, aren't going to script write scripts. Um, you know, that, that was really why the task tool got created was because I assume people would write scripts. Nobody ever wrote scripts. So the tasks really were designed to avoid that. The watch folder tool is really designed for folks to not, again, have to write scripts to do a bunch of things. But for folks who work in environments where they have um, the expertise uh, to do it, um, you can either, you can use the command line tool and write scripts in whatever language you want to and just have the, 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 the script call the command line to do whatever's there. Um, or you can write directly to the application's um, uh, libraries uh, via a scripting language that can access the, uh, the Windows um, uh, com objects. So that would be the, uh, the, um, the automation uh, object oriented part of the Windows application. Uh, and automate your work um, in new and different ways. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. So if there are particular questions, um, feel free to uh, let me know and I'll try and answer them the best that I can. Does the Linux version have a watch function too? So that's a good question. So it um, does, uh, it works the same way as the, um, the, the, um, the Windows version, Linux version does. Uh, the Linux version, the way the graphics, the, 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 the graphic, it, it gets interacted with through the graphics part. So if you started up Mark Edit, it would run that way. Um, <clears throat> I believe it would run through the startup as well um, because the way that the .NET, uh, the way that the program installs a watcher is it asks for whatever the system startup folder um, and it places a shortcut into that space, so it should boot um, that way. Uh, you may find, though, that inside of um, uh, Linux, you may have to do some tweaking, in which case um, I could probably walk you through the process of how you would do that. Uh, essentially, it calls Mark Edit using a, head, using a command line that basically tells it it's a headless version of the application. Um, but from a practical perspective, um, because the, the Linux version and the Windows version are exactly the same version, um, they just run um, using uh, different versions of the .NET framework, it should in theory work. Um, but I'll be honest, I, I haven't tried it because when I'm on Linux, I usually only use the command line version of the application. So um, on the command line version, since I can run tasks and do kind of the same kind of thing that I would do in the watch folder, I usually write scripts that call the command line tool um, to replicate the same functionality on the Linux, on the Linux side. Uh, the place where I'm trying to figure out um, if I can do the same kind of thing is on the Mac side. It's a little bit different in terms of how Apple does um, their uh, uh, service model. And since this is a program that has to run um, 
kind of in the background. I, there are two ways to do it. One requires um, the application to essentially register itself as a uh, with the operating system in a trusted way that I would prefer not to do because I don't need that level of access into the operating system. The other way um, requires Apple's system to, um, how am I gonna say this, to um, allow uh, multiple versions of MarkEdit to run um, in different, uh, containered threads and I haven't quite figured out how to do that since Apple's the way that Apple runs applications tends to work very differently it tends to run them all within the same space and so I haven't quite figured out how that works yet but I, I do believe on the Linux side it it probably would work but like I said um, I tend to replicate the functionality through scripts uh, through the command line <clears throat> so I'm not sure if folks have any other questions. Um, like I said, I will um, sort out the, like I said, the, the changes to the watcher functionality. I'm not quite sure where that, that came from with the .NET framework, but I'm, I'll have that sorted out probably by the, the end of today. And so it'll show up in the next Mark Edit update um, that uh, will sort out the, um, the watcher not working and the uh, where I set like a specific time when I want things to work. So that was that was a little quirky. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just like normal, I'll post this back up to um, YouTube. I'll make the slides available for folks um, in case you want to go back and look at them. Um, and uh, then we will do this all again probably next week. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.